Okay, let's jump into that first question. Matt, sorry, trying to finish up that oil change. Uh, all of the following statements are true except A, the magnetic lines of force leave the South Pole and enter the North Pole. B, the higher the current through a conductor, the stronger the magnetic flux. C, magnetic lines of force never intersect. D, around every conductor carrying a current, there is a magnetic field. Which one is that? The magnetic lines of force leave the South Pole and enter the North Pole. According to our answer key, that's the answer for that. But I will tell you this. Uh, a conductor carrying current has got a magnetic field around it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. All right. Magnetic lines of force never intersect. Oh, you know, what do you think about that one? What about the higher the current through a conductor, the stronger the magnetic flux? It sounds to me like this should have been in all of the above. Don't it sound to you like that? What do you think? You sound like that? All right. Uh, technician A says some DC motors use brushes. Technician B says an AC synchronous motor uses a permanent magnet motor. And which technician is connected? Remember, this is about hybrid vehicles, right? Yeah, that is, uh, that's a C. Both technicians, the DC motors use brushes. And uh, the, you ever, uh, do you guys remember, you ever know about, back before they started using alternators, they used generators, which looked kind of like a starter, except it was driven by a belt. You remember seeing those? Uh, now, why is it, think about this, why is it that an alternator has to have diodes, a rectifier bridge, and a generator didn't need that? Well, actually, the alternator is producing alternating current, but it has to be rectified by those diodes, exactly. So it's going to catch it and it can't come out. Well, but what about the generator? Why does it not need diodes? Okay, where's the field on a generator? Now, I mean, where's the field on an alternator? Where's the magnetic field created on an alternator? In the part in the middle, the rotor that spins. It's got you got those two brushes that slide on those rings. That creates your magnetic field, and as it sweeps across those windings, it creates the juice, and that goes out through the rectifier, and that actually charges the battery. But on a generator, the magnetic field is created around the outside, and the part that spins in the middle is where the juice is created. So it's reversed from see this backwards, and so how does it get out of that? part on the inside and get out to the battery. It's going through brushes. The brushes are sliding across Tommy Taters like a starter and so the only time it can go out is when they're lined up. Got me? So if it's got brushes like a starter the, the brushes act as the rectifier. They actually make it work. Is that, uh, huh? Are there any vehicles like starter generators? Not diesel. Not, not, not that I know of. I don't know of any diesels like that. But I mean some of your... Uh, your Chevrolet pickups, they have the, uh, they have a starter generator with a big belt on around the crankshaft. They got those, and they're only I usually run, I think, off 36 volts or something like that. And they, they let off. When you let off, they die. And then when you give them the gas, it starts up and goes again like a golf cart. Yeah, <laughs> there's some Chevy pickups like that. Uh, the power of most electric motors is expressed in, incidentally, number two was C. The power of most electric motors is expressed in A, watts, B, horsepower, C, kilowatts, or D, amps. What is it? That's actually C. That's in kilowatt, believe it or not. An AC synch- oh, excuse me. AC synchronous motors used in hybrid electric vehicles use how many windings in the stationary part of the motor? How about three? You got that big orange cable that comes from that battery back in the back is actually, and, and incidentally, I want you to think about this. When you're talking about a hybrid vehicle, what's coming out of that battery pack in the back? What kind of current? It's got to be DC. A battery's not going to produce AC current, is it? But you're going to use AC current to do your work because with AC current, you can typically do more with AC current with smaller wires, but you're doing a lot of work with this one anyway. So you're actually going to take this DC current and you're going to run it through everywhere there's a motor that's doing any serious work, you're going to have an inverter. And it's going to change that DC current into AC current, and it's coming out of that inverter on three wires, and they're basically marked with three different letters. And uh, I can't remember, W, Y, A, or something like that. But anyway, they're hooked to that motor, and whenever they're hooked to the motor, and it actually, there's what they call a resolver that works in conjunction with that, and it's basically sending that those pulses to those uh, windings, so it's making that thing go. So it's using AC current, in spite of the fact that there's DC current coming out of the battery, there's all this heavy-duty electronics. Heat's created there, and that's why you have to have cooling for that 
uh, inverter system for your transaxle. You know that big thing is sticking up on the top of the transaxle if you open a hybrid? Uh, there's actually a special separate discrete cooling system for that. Discrete, D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E. That means it's separate and apart from the other cooling system, and it's only there for cooling the electronics and all that. But anyway, that's basically got three windings. The technician A says a traction AC synchronous motor used in a hybrid electric vehicle is controlled by varying the voltage of the motor. Technician B says the frequency of the current is controlled. Which technician is correct? That is C. That is C. Both technicians are right about that. Technician A says a DC to DC converter is used to convert 12 volts from a battery to a higher voltage to run electric motors in a hybrid electric vehicle. That is dead wrong. Technician B says a DC to DC converter is used to convert the voltage from the motor generator to a higher voltage to charge of high voltage batteries. That's wrong. Uh, what does a DC to DC converter do? How much uh, your uh, you've got DC current coming out of your big battery, and it's got to go through a DC to DC converter and be dropped down to twelve to well, fourteen and a half volts, so that it can charge your battery and operate your battery. You got a regular twelve volt battery. I mean, not regular, but you got a twelve volt battery like a, a, a Toyota's got a glass mat battery on there. Uh, but incidentally, I don't know if you noticed or not, but you could buy a glass mat battery for your for your vehicle right now from uh, Advanced Auto Parts. They make one, and it lasts longer than a regular battery and all that. But anyway, the long and short of it is that battery is charged up by the current that's coming out of this DC to DC converter. And back there, when you fire that thing up, you know, like on your air conditioners, you got these contactors, you know, that fire up the compressor. That's the way this is, too. It's got to make that connection because all that voltage is so high. If it doesn't make that connection real fast, it's like a welding machine. It just burns the contacts up real quick. <laughs> so it slams them together. In the back, you got the little contactors that go thunk, you know, and they're operated by 12 volts. But when they make contact, and remember what I told you about the, the, the power in the ground on, the, uh, on that big DC battery does not hook to the chassis of the car anywhere. It's totally isolated from the chassis of the car. I mean, it's a totally different electrical system. However, coming off of that, we're going through, you know, we actually are going to our 12 volt electrical system so we can charge a battery. We're going to run our dash and all. I mean, don't you know how dumb it would be to have 330 volts or 600 volts or whatever running the instruments on the dash and all that stuff? You know, you don't need that. So why don't we just drop it down in a DC to DC converter does that. You're still wanting it to be DC volts, but you're going to go bring it down to world charge a battery. All right. So that's just, this is some of this hybrid vehicle learning stuff. So the number six is basically D. Neither one of those guys were right. What type of an electric motor? Is, oh, incidentally, the DC to DC converter on a uh, a Toyota Highlander is ten thousand dollars, and sometimes they fail. <laughs> that's, that's that's scary, isn't it? This one lady called me with a hybrid a Highlander. She wanted to sell the school for a trainer vehicle, which she wanted a lot of money for it because the DC to DC converter had gone bad, and she didn't want to have to pay for one. And so she just wanted me. To, she wanted me to give her a big wad of money for her vehicle to use it as a trainer car. And I don't have enough money in my budget to buy a broke down hybrid, you know, and then get it going again. It's real silly. Um, if she wanted to donate it, I'd be glad to take it. But she didn't want that. She's trying to get her money out of it, which is an interesting commentary, you know. All right. What type of electric motors used for the traction motor in hybrid electric vehicles? Is it a DC brush type? Wait a minute. You guys haven't been listening, have you? It's actually. It's not AC, is it? Well, it is an AC induction type motor, right? But you got number seven. I mean, that that's, that's D. Both B and C are used. You can use either a brushless DC motor or an AC induction type. But now, it depends on the vehicle. They don't all have the same thing. They've also got brushless DC motors that operate that little water pump. You know, the, like if you got the little plastic, you know, little plastic water pump. That moves the coolant around on some of these little Toyotas, and it's 12 volt, but it's a brushless motor, and it's and that one's AC. So if you say, well, this is a 12 volt motor, I'll just hook a battery up to it and see if it'll run. It ain't gonna run, because it ain't a motor that works with off a battery. It has to have you know, these uh, you know, that's uh, interesting to me. I, when I first found that out, I was like, well, that's a crummy deal. You know, what am I gonna test this thing with? You know, <laughs> and you gotta have some uh, 12 volt uh, alternating current. Okay, number eight, uh, the blank are used to rectify AC to DC current. That'd be a, some of them older guys used to call them dao. You ever anybody call a dao a dao? You know, that's what you call That's a dao. What's the most common type of rotor used in an, an AC synchronous motor? That's a sort of a tough question. And what about a permanent magnet? Permanent magnet. Question number 10. Uh, why are permanent why are permanent magnet motors better? 
I mean, they went. They got away from you. You know the starters we got under the bench out here that's got the field coils in them? They're bigger, they're heavier, and they're complicated the way they're wired. All that stuff's wired in series. If you got permanent magnets in there, you can have a smaller motor that's really strong. Of course, a lot of the times you'll have it going through reduction gears, you know, like on a starter to go. But the long and short of it is it can spin really fast, and it doesn't take up as much weight. It's lighter, it's cheaper to build, and it's not as complicated to wire it up. You know, it uses less copper. Uh, current sensors are, more, are commonly used by the motor controller to help with the tasks of motor management. What type of sensor is used for this task? Hall effect, piezoelectric, potentiometer, or Wheatstone bridge? That would be a Hall effect. A Hall effect, you know, is one that generates a square wave. It's an on-off, on-off, on-off. It doesn't go up and down like a sine wave. Technician A says a broken magnet becomes two magnets. Is that right? You break a magnet in half, it becomes two magnets. Technician B says there's a strong relationship between magnetism and electricity. Who's right about that? Both of them are right. Induced voltages may be increased by doing what? What's an induced voltage? How do you induce voltage? Any idea? If I wanted to induce some voltage right here in front of you, how would I do it? That wire. What if I took a little copper, some of this motor wire that's got this shellac on it so that when you wrap it up, it doesn't touch itself? I'm not talking about naked copper wire, but it's shellac colored wire. And I wrap it around and around and around and around and around and around, and around and make a little loop, and I got two ends sticking out. And I got me a little motor through there. I mean, excuse me, a little um, light bulb hooked up to it. And if I get my magnet here, and I've wrapped it pretty close, I can take this magnet and go through that little copper winding really, really, really fast like that, that light would start. I'm inducing voltage with that magnetism going by that copper. Anytime magnetism goes sweeping across copper windings, it creates electricity. You got me? That's why when you have to have a clamping diode in your air conditioner for clutch, you know that? Your air conditioner clutch got to have a clamping diode in it because whenever you turn off that air conditioner clutch, that magnetic field collapses. And as that magnetism goes sweeping across those windings, it causes a spike. You got me? You understand that? Everybody clear on that? So if you put a clamping diode in there, that spike doesn't go screaming back into your engine controller or whatever and kicking it in the teeth. It basically just chases its tail until it goes away through that diode. All right. So, number 12. Uh, 12, the answer to 12 is D. You can increase the number of conductors. You can increase the speed the conductors pass through the flux field, which is magnetic flux. Uh, increase the strength of the magnetic field. And how many of you know what a flux capacitor is? Anything you got to put on your DeLorean so you can go back to the future? Is that what they think? <laughs> All right. Let's see. An induced current moves so the magnetic field opposes the motion that's induced the current. Hmm, isn't that interesting? What do you call that? Number 13. Did I, did I do 12? Yeah. Uh, an induced current moves so that its magnetic field opposes the motion that induced the current. You, do you know the answer to that one, Ed? You remember that from electronics when you took that over there? Uh, an induced current. Okay, the web principle is called Lenz's Law. L-E-N-Z apostrophe S. L-E-N-Z apostrophe S. Got that? One of the first electric motors was made by which in, which inventor? Franklin. Faraday. Faraday. Now, if you know, you're about, about talking about his electromagnetic pulse that destroy all electronics if they light off a nuke in the atmosphere and all that stuff. You ever heard about that? You know, the Iranians are trying to figure out a way to launch a nuclear up here and blow it up about 60 miles above the United States and everything goes dark. You know, we're back in the Stone Age again. You know, nothing works. Cars won't run. Well, if you want to protect something from being destroyed like that, you can put it in a Faraday cage, and it will protect it. And everybody, most everybody's got a Faraday cage in their house. If you got something that you want to protect from an electromagnetic pulse, put it in a microwave. That's a Faraday cage. It'll keep, it'll protect it. I'll have to fit a car in there. You wouldn't be able to. That's a problem. You know. Anyway, we. <laughs> that's a Faraday cage. That's what it is. All right, now, you, none of you guys ever read my Digital Superman book? Because we were talking about that kind of thing in there. Okay. You read it, didn't you? Remember me talking about that EMP thing and all? Yeah. It never, you know, whatever. Okay, technician A says the speed of a DC motor is proportional to the applied current. Is that right? Yes. That sounds right, don't it? Have you, have you ever tested a starter? Technician B says the torque of a DC motor is proportional to the applied voltage. True. Hmm, which technician is correct about that? A. 
<laughs> Let's say that uh, on that one, we're going to say neither one of those guys is right. What? Yeah. They're actually, uh, they're actually basically doing it backwards. The more voltage you apply, the faster it runs. Remember what I was talking about the other day? We would take some of these Volkswagen bugs, went back to my dad, but get a Volkswagen bug, and in 1966, it would be like a, I'm trying to remember when they went from 6 to 12 volt in a Volkswagen bug. Anyway, he would put a 12 volt system in there. He put a 12 volt generator, and he put a 12 volt battery, and he put a 12 volt voltage regulator, and all this kind of stuff. And so what would happen is uh, the starter was not interchangeable from 6 to 12 volt, but it didn't matter because when you put twice you put twice as much voltage in there, that starter would spin the ever-loving crap out of it. Whee! Just about throw it out of the car. I mean, it was spinning 500 RPM, which is three times, or even two and a half times as fast as it would at the regular start. But that's the more voltage you apply to that DC motor, the faster it's going to turn. However, it's going to give you more torque when you give it more current. Now, voltage and current do this. If you've got, like if I've got an AC, if I've got an air conditioning unit, like I'm going to put a window unit in here, I'm going to get cooler in here, right? Okay, if I put a 110-volt window unit in here, and it pulls 20 amps, right? What if I got a unit just like that, but I'm going to get a 220 version of that unit? If it's got twice as much voltage, it requires half as much amps. You see what I'm saying? The more push you got, the less amps it requires. You see? See how that works? you got to look at that balancing act on that. Just remember that. All right, so uh, let me say true, false. Write T if the statement is true and F if the statement is false. That's usually how we do that, isn't it? Okay, all electric motors must use direct current. Whoa! <laughs> we done talked about that. You see an electric motor that uses, what about your ceiling fan at home? You know, click, click, and boom, 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 boom. All right, all electric motors must use brushes to transfer electric current. That's false, too. You don't have to have brushes. Uh, technician A says, there's nine or more electric motors in electric hybrid vehicles. Technician B says, many of these motors use an electronic control module to control their operation. Which technician is correct? Both. C, both of them. We say both of them. Uh, what term describes the ability of an object or surface to distort an electric charge? What You got resistance, reluctance, inductance, or capacitance? Capacitance. There you go, capacitance. That's the little thing that I, the little thing that I never show my students because they'll go stupid with it is how you charge up a condenser and lay it down over and when somebody picks it up, it goes pow, and it shocks them, you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever been hurt by that because, you know, typically if somebody picks up a little can that's got that wire coming out with a little fork terminal in it, and if they pick it up, for some reason they have to touch this. I don't know why. <laughs> if it's charged up, it'll bite them, you know. But, uh, and most of the, if, uh, if anybody ever tries to hand you one of them or throws it to you, you need to just let it go by. You know, if you know if you see it coming and it looks like a little, you know, it looks like a firecracker. It's a little steel can. It's got a wire coming off. Just don't catch it. Or we try to hand it to you. Don't take it. You know, or if you do take it, take it by the wire and bend it around so the little thing touches the can. Let it go pop, and then okay, now I can handle it. You see, if you do that. I'm, I've been trying to get make you wise so that you don't get, you know, hoodooed. You know, these guys ask for us a, a young boy that goes there to get a. Uh, they send him for. Uh, you may have heard me talking about this before. Uh, they send you for like a, a meat stretcher or sky hooks or some silly nonsense like that, you know. I mean, like because of the young guy that's got to get initiated. And the boys at the tire store told this guy, said, call and get us a tire stretcher. You know, he needs some, some tires and he's stretching. He didn't know no better, so he calls and he says, I was, I was, I've been told to call and order a tire stretcher. And the CarQuest equipment says, sure, we can bring you one you know, for Crassy. So he says, okay, they're bringing one. They went, ha, 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 they're just giving you the little horse line. And they showed up with a $5,000 tire stretcher. <laughs> and what it was, you know, these tires that you leave stacked until the steel belts have caved in and they're too flat to use, this thing was made to straighten that out <laughs> where you could use those tires. And they were just woofing at him. You got to watch what you tell somebody because, you know, wow. Anyway, the, the uh, guy that owned the tire store had to pay a restocking fee. <laughs> That's pretty considerable, $5,000. Okay. And I can tell you the guy's name that that happened to, that young boy. Was that, his name was Keith Reynolds. He's the one that told me that story. He said they told me to call. And I, anyway, he's doing transmissions now. <laughs> place in the I used to work. Okay, um, let's see. What type of regenerative braking system uses an electro-hydraulic system? Hmm. Series and parallel? Neither series or parallel. Series or parallel. That's number 20. That is going to be C. Series, and you remember the difference, right? 
Yes. Remember the difference. The ones, the different ones, the series hybrid design, you know, is that right there? And then the parallel design is like right there. All right, you got that? Okay, now then, we flip over here to the next page, move across. Number 21, kinetic energy is... G. Pardon me? The energy needed for the batteries to propel a vehicle, the energy the motor produces to propel a vehicle, the energy the driver exerts on the brake pedal, or the, ah, the energy in a moving object. You learned that in school, didn't you? I remember that. Remember that. Inertia is what? All right. Hmm? Yeah, you the energy of any moving object that has mass, which in parentheses we have the word weight. Right? That's it. Okay. Now, inertia basically says something that's in motion is going to stay in motion unless it's affected by an outside force and something is, you know, it's either going to stay still or it's going to stay moving unless something stops it or starts it moving. And, you know, like you say, uh, you ever seen these things where people have a bunch of smooth disks, you know, back some of the checkers used to be? And you could actually slide a checker across the table, and if it whacks that bottom checker, unless it's got a little sawtooth like some checkers do, it will knock that bottom checker out from under it and the rest of them will just sit there. You know what I mean? Have you ever seen somebody jerk a tablecloth off and leave all the dishes sitting there? You ever seen them do that? That's inertia that's making that happen. And what if I'm swinging a, a bucket around and it's got water in it and it don't come out? What force is it that's keeping that in there? I'm swinging a bucket around. It's got water in it. It's half full of water. And I'm swinging it around on a rope, and it's going around and around like this. The water's staying in it, even though the bucket's like that. What for, what's the force? Gravity. Yeah, centrifugal force. Centrifugal force. Yeah. All right, now, if you've got a bunch of kids on a merry-go-round out there, and the, uh, whenever I went to school as a little boy, there was a sort of a, when they, you know, merry-go-rounds, you push around, and everybody gets on. And uh, there were so many kids on that doggone thing, you couldn't even see it. It's like a big mass of kids turning out there. There's dust everywhere. I mean, that was when I was in elementary school. An old thing. I mean, it was kind of tilted a little bit. It was cool as all get out. And I was afraid to go get on. I afraid I'd get knocked upside the head by somebody's shoe because they were spinning it around. Man, this thing was just a mass of humanity. But if you spin that thing fast enough and kids fly off of it, they always fly off of it spinning in the same direction it was spinning. And that's called the conservation of angular momentum. You see what I'm saying? So just remember that. You know, That kind of flies in the face of the Big Bang Theory, and the people that believe in Big Bang don't like that because some of the planets turn the opposite direction, some of the moons and stuff do. And if what they're believing is true, then that don't work. See? Okay. How did I get off on that? I'm, I'm just... Okay, so... Inertia got me started on that. Technician A says the powertrain control module or controller... Can change, control the voltage of the motors in a hybrid electric vehicle. Technician B says the PCM or controller can control electric motors by varying the frequency of the applied current. These are these questions are hard to parse if you're not listening or if you're not reading it carefully. In it, that's C. The powertrain control module or controller can control the voltage of the motors in a hybrid electric vehicle, and it does. And then technician B says it controls them by varying the frequency of the applied current. Uh, during the hybrid braking, excuse me, during braking on a hybrid ve electric vehicle equipped with a regenerative braking system, what occurs when the driver depresses the brake pedal? Depress. What's that? Pardon me? The friction brakes are only used as a backup and are not used during normal braking. Motors become generators. The batteries are charged to 100% state of charge. The driver needs to apply a braking lever instead of depressing the brake pedal and <laughs> energize the regenerative braking system. That's actually B. The motors become generators. I will tell you this one thing on a lot of these hybrid vehicles. You need to be if you're doing if you're doing a brake inspection on hybrid vehicles, make sure you go to your book, make sure you know exactly what you're doing. Like on, on your Ford Escapes, you need to disable uh, some of the electronics on there so that it doesn't accidentally apply the brakes while you're working on them. That's not a good thing. Especially if your hand is in the way, you know, you could lose things like that. But on the other hand, you know this thing I like this sign I got on the left side here says caution, keep fingers. You seen that? I mean, don't lose any of your fingers while you're here. Not, I've never had anybody do that, but I would advise you to hang on to all your fingers. But what I was going to say was, if you look the brakes, like most of the time when we look at brakes, we pop it up, we jerk the front wheels off, and we don't really think a lot about the back brakes, right? Because they don't usually wear out all that much most of the time. Well, on a hybrid vehicle, they do. On a hybrid, you'll probably put two sets of back brakes on some of these hybrid vehicles before you have to change one set of front ones. So just keep that in mind, right? Always look at the back ones on a hybrid because they may be wore out. Um, you just need to look at all four of them anyway, though. You know what I'm saying? 
Have you ever looked? Have you ever just done a halfway job inspecting something and found out you missed something that you should have got and you want to kick yourself for it? Who's ever done that? Have you done that, Daniel? Have you done that? You have done that. Haven't you? That's right. And that's something that Bruce Donaldson will not put up with. He wants you to look that thing over with a fine tooth comb, don't he? Mm-hmm. All right. Now then, let's see. Uh, technician A says front wheel drive hybrid vehicle can only generate electricity during braking from the front wheel motors. Technician B says anti lock braking system is not possible with a vehicle equipped with a regenerative braking system. Who is correct? That's A. A only. In a regenerative braking system, which part of the electric motor is being controlled by the computer? Uh, the rotor, the rotor and stator, neither the rotor or stator, or the stator. Mm-hmm. Who said that? SD, actually. Remember I told you that Craig uh, Van Battenberg had this one that you could turn the, with a, the stator being the outside part, you could turn that inside part with a crank, and then when he energized one of the legs of that stator, it got harder, and when he energized two of the legs of the stator, it got a lot harder. When he energized the third one, you couldn't even turn that sucker because it would just totally stop it. And that's how it operates the brakes. So he had that motor sitting there to demonstrate that. And the thing about it is he went to a lot of trouble to build it, and by the time you've turned that crank for about 30 seconds, you've learned everything that things out of teaching, you walk away. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's trained a lot of people on that, and it's a good thing. Um, in a Toyota Prius regenerative braking system, how many pressure sensors are used? Three. Uh, C. Read that as pressure sensors. Got it? That's four. Got it? Number 27. Okay, now in a Toyota Prius regenerative braking system, how many pressure switches are used? Two. All right. Well, that's actually going to be two. How did you know this? You been studying? All right. I'm I'm sure. All right. Uh, Two technicians are discussing deceleration rates. Technician A says that a 1G stop is a gentle slowing of the vehicle. Technician B says that stopping the rate at 8 feet per second squared is a severe stop. Who is correct about that? Anybody know? Nine. I mean, 29 is is D. I'm sorry. That's a... A lot of some of this stuff you'll never use to fix a car. You notice that some of these questions, some of the stuff we're talking about, some of these principles is basically background material for what so you can understand it. It's not yeah, you're not going to sit here and most of the time you don't use Ohm's law to fix something's wrong with like Ed's Jeep. You basically would use Ed's Jeep. You you just you know track it down as quick as you can, throw the parts on it you think are it, and if that doesn't fix it, Ed still has to pay the bill. And there I did. I'm kidding. All right, the high-voltage batteries are designed to be charged no more than what? We talked about this, or actually Craig talked about it. 80%. Yeah, 80% is high as no they need to go. less than 20. Yeah, from 80, between 80 and 20, but it basically between 40 and 60 is optimum, but definitely between, you know, 80 and 20. What position is the throttle pedal in during regenerative braking? That's in C. Fully lifted, obviously. You're not going to get regenerative braking if you're giving it, you know, if you apply in throttle. In the Toyota Prius, which controller is responsible for regenerative braking control? That's going to be B, the ABS ECU. That's interesting, isn't it? What do you think about that? When changing the brake pads on a Ford Escape Hybrid, I mentioned this a minute ago, what precaution must be taken before removing the brake pads? Use a scan tool to enter pad service mode. Because if you don't do that, every now and then that thing will actually apply the brakes just arbitrarily, you know, so it can make sure everything's still okay when it's just sitting still. And so you don't want to, you know, don't want that to happen while you're working on it. Now, there is a fuse you can pull if you know which one it is. And it's best to have a scan tool in there, pad service mode. In a hybrid vehicle electric motor, which component moves to supply torque to the wheels? Now, what did we talk about here on that? That's number 34. What is it that what is it that moves to supply torque to the wheels? Is it the stator, the frame, the brushes, or the rotor? The frame. Come on, you know the you frame is the hole. Said, no, you said the stator lock, you had to connect stuff, and then the inside you turned it outside. Well, I know, but what is it that's actually turning? The uh, crank? I'm turning. The stator is actually going to be the what would be hooked to the wheels. Yeah, but what is it that's actually turning? The crank I'm turning is actually going to be what would be hooked to the wheels. Remember the engine is hooked to the uh, planetary carrier? And the, one of the motors is hooked to the sun gear and the other one's hooked to the ring gear on that, you know, variable transmission thing. 
But anyway, the part that turns is the part in the middle. That's what you'd expect on a motor, right? Okay, so back up, changing the brake pads on a Ford Escape hybrid, you use a scan tool inner pad service mode in a hybrid vehicle electric motor. The rotor applies torque to the wheels, and actually is what moves. And number 35, regenerative braking uses the inertia of the vehicle to recapture energy during braking. On these Ford Fusions, I've actually, when I was driving one of them, I've actually seen it and looked with, with a scan tool, uh, or actually riding with somebody that was driving, you know, that, while I was in scan. I drove it some, but you don't look at the scan tool while you're driving it because it's not a good thing to do. Look at this thing, and you could hit the brake on that thing if you stop a lot. I think that battery voltage would go up to 600 volts because of the regenerative braking. Um, all right, let me see here. Regenerative braking uses the inertia of the vehicle to recapture energy during braking. Where is the recaptured energy stored? Duh. Which, where is it stored, guys? Where's it going? The high voltage battery bank, right? Number 36, the hybrid electric vehicle motor is usually what kind of a motor? Is it DC? Is it HVAC? Is it AC? Is it none of these? You guys been listening? What was I talking about earlier? AC. AC, that's right. Everybody's waiting for somebody else to answer the question. A brushless motor works by doing what? Brushless motor works by doing what? A. Rapidly switching the stator field windings. That's how, that has to be done uh, pretty quick, too. Some hybrid vehicles reduce the internal combustion engine's braking capacity during acceleration so that the regenerative braking is more efficient. Remember how we, talk, we talked about that the other day, too? Or uh, Craig did on that video. Remember that? What does it do? Um, remember, what it, remember that video that we watched the other day? Kills the spark. Um, All right. I mean, it basically, even if you kill the spark, isn't the engine still up, acting like an air compressor? You know, boom, engine braking. So you really don't want that. So you want to take all the compression away. Oh, well, on every cylinder except number one. See? It actually, huh? It's not going to close the valve, it? Well, if it closes the intake valve, it can't get any air, and it won't have anything to squeeze. You got me? Yeah. Is that what it's actually going to be? Uh, C on that one, closing the valves in some cylinders. Oh. That's right. But oh. see, like, if you close the valve, well, you remember me telling you that little, uh, about that time that I checked that uh, engine that didn't have any compression on one of the cylinders and the guy up front that told me to go ahead and rebuild it. Said, you know, I put oil in there and then it made it have 180 pounds. It went from zero compression to 180 pounds on a wet test. I said, I guess this thing got rings bad or something because it, you know, the compression went from zero to 180. He said, oh, yeah, well, they hadn't had it rebuilt in a while. I'll go ahead and throw some rings and bearings and stuff in it, you know, in frame over them. And I pulled the valve cover off, and somebody had over that thing, I guess, and one of the push rods had come out and was laying down in the valley. <laughs> but, and, it, and what happens is when I put the oil in there, that piston was able to have more suction, and it sucked the valve open, pulled air in there, and then squeezed it. <laughs> Bugged me, because I, I missed that. I should have pulled the valve cover and see what was going on, but I never thought, you know. I mean, the old rule of thumb was, if it ain't got no compression, put oil in there. If compression comes up, you got rings. Well, if that intake valve is, you know, not, nothing open in it, you're going to have that. And you put oil in there, and it gets compression. That doesn't mean the rings are bad necessarily. So you need to check your stuff, you know. Uh, let's see. Uh, when the hybrid electric motor is acting as a generator, it produces alternating current. This current is converted to direct current by use of what? <laughs> He's right. Uh, he's a really a gifted guesser. I'm telling you, he can he ever guess. Uh, well, a battery. Oh, please. Okay. So, is it lunchtime? <laughs>